Recently, we talked about the call which focused on the life and the call of the prophet Isaiah. For those of you guys who weren't here, you can check it out online, focusmin.org, and go up to the media tab where you'll be able to find recent messages. But in that passage of scripture of Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 9, we talked about how Isaiah was called by God. We talked about a calling in um, plain vernacular may be what we refer to as purpose. You hear plenty of times people always talking about your purpose. You see a, a section of books when you go in Barnes and Nobles or even if you go to the university bookstore, there's probably a section there that may say inspirational readings and a good portion of those books may focus on finding your purpose. Uh, operating in your purpose, 10 steps to a successful life, or self-help guru books like that. But one thing that we talked about, that when it comes to a call of God, uh, it's not just a purpose based upon human intellect, but it's a higher purpose. There's a higher calling. The reason why it's a higher calling is because it's not something that you could obtain from the person that's sitting next to you. It's not something that you could obtain from the person in your class. It's not something that you could obtain uh, from Old Dominion University. But the reason why it's a calling, the reason why we consider it a higher calling is because you have somebody who is higher than you, that is God, and he speaks to you and gives you a divine assignment and tells you why he's created you and why he's placed you on this earth. So we talked about Isaiah's call. What was he called to? He was called to preach the word of the Lord. He was called to say what God spoke to him and to declare it, not only to the people of God, but to also people who did not know God so that way they could turn from their lifestyle and turn to God. And then in the midst of Isaiah chapter six, chapter six, verse one through nine, we not only focused on his call, but we also talked about his commission. The word commission simply means to be sent out. Similar to how Jesus sent the apostles out when you look all throughout the four gospels, Matthew, you all the way to the end of John. The Bible talks about how he sent them out. He said, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was their commission. As a matter of fact, we refer to it in Matthew 28 as the Great Commission. But nonetheless, every person, as I said a few weeks ago, has a purpose and a call on their life. However, the only way you and I can find out what in fact we're called to do is whether or not we have a relationship with the Lord. And in addition to this, not just whether or not we have a relationship with the Lord, but us finding out what it is he's called us to do has everything to do with how well we are staying in tune with his voice. Look at the person beside and say, you can't just sleep. You got to walk with him too. I'll explain what I mean by that in a few minutes. Here's what I mean by that. People walk around aimlessly doing whatever. You know people who have signed up for classes and they have no reason why they did so. Some of us in here have signed up for classes and had no reason whatsoever why we were doing so. Some of us right now are in majors right now and you have absolutely no clue and no idea why you're there. No, you do, let me, let me take that back. You're there because your mom and your pops told you. You're there because your guidance counselor from high school said you were good at this and so it would be a good idea for you to pursue this. But nonetheless, people walk around aimlessly, not having a clue why they're here and what they're supposed to be doing in their life. So now what happens is I fulfill uh, what some may argue the first commandment of the um, satanic cult, do as thou wilt. I just do whatever I want. I just do whatever I feel. Only for us to run into the issue where we understand that what I feel has the ability to change from day to day. So one day I feel like being an engineer, so I'm an engineer. The next day I feel like being a doctor, so I become a doctor. The next day I feel like being a nurse, so I become a nurse. The next day I feel like being a PE teacher, so now I become a PE teacher. The next day I feel like being a sports medicine major, so now I'm being sports, getting sports medicine. The next day I feel like doing this, the next day I feel like doing that. See, the thing is when you and I base what we are in life based upon how we feel, the reality is it will always change. Here's the reason why. Because your feelings always change. One day you're cool, the next day you're not. One day you're having the best day known to man. You're feeling good, you woke up feeling good about yourself, but then maybe the next day you just felt terrible about yourself. One day you felt good, body-wise. The next day you got a cold out of nowhere. Nonetheless, if you and I base our lives based upon what we think about ourselves or based upon how we feel about ourselves, we will always walk around aimlessly. We will always walk around unfulfilled. But here's the awesome thing. The reason why you and I do not have to plan out our lives is because God has already set a course and a track for us. For some of us who may be thinking, no, nah, man, that's not cool. That's that whole predestination crap. And I want to be in control of my own stuff. Let me help you understand. How has that been working out for you? <laughs> I mean, for real, has your life been all hunky-dory? No. 
Has your life been perfect? No. Have you made the right decision all the time from birth to now? No. So, how has it been working out for you? Clearly, your plan in life is not working. Clearly, my plan in life is not working outside of the will of God. But here's what God says in Jeremiah 29, 11. He says this, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I don't know about you, man. That's a great and banging plan. Why would, not, why would I not want to invest my life in that? Why would I not want to invest my life into something that is going to give me a 100% return on my investment called life? Why would I not want to invest my life into something that's going to benefit me, not just in the long run, but benefit me now? That's, that's, that's the good news of the gospel. That God has already laid out this awesome plan for us. Now, here's the crazy thing. Here's how God works, though. God's like, listen, I have, I have a plan, and I think this is going to work. Matter of fact, I don't think I know because I know all things. I know it's the best thing for you. But because I'm so loving, I'm not going to cause you to be a robot and program how you feel. I'm still going to give you the ability to choose what you want to do. Matter of fact, he did it all the way from the back of the beginning of the Bible. You look at Genesis chapters 1 through 3. What did God tell Adam and Eve? For those of you guys who know, he said this. You can eat from any tree that you want. This, these trees that you eat from, man, they're good for you. They'll prosper you. You get a lot from them. Nothing but life. But there's one tree you cannot touch. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat from that tree, you going to die. Now. Let's, let's just put this in systematic terms. One option, plan A, equals life. Plan B equals death. Which one makes more sense to choose? Come on, it's not rocket science, y'all. A equals life, B equals death. Which one makes more sense? But you know we choose death all the time. Some of y'all are like, no, I don't do that. Let me show you how. Plan A. Don't go get drunk and not have to worry about a hangover. Plan B, get tipsy, get bent, drink till you have no kidney left. You're going to have the night of your life. But the next morning, you're going to have a hangover. The next morning, you may be in a prison cell because you were driving while intoxicated. The next morning, you may not even know where you are because your mind is so jacked. Which option makes more sense, A or B? But why do you and I struggle with this thing? We know what we're supposed to do, but yet we don't choose what we're supposed to do. And that's how much God loves us. Because God understands that real love is not predicated based upon me forcing you to love me. Real love is based upon choice. You can choose. Some of you guys who are in here who just think, you know, I just can't control who I love. I'm like, yeah, it's you can. <laughs> You, you love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Love is an action word. And so because it's a choice, that's why God says, choose this day who you will serve. In other words, choose this, day, choose this day who you will love. Either you will love yourself more or you will love me more. So God says, when it comes to the plan that I have for you, I have a great plan. And it's going to lead to prosperity. Yes, you may have some bumps and some bruises. That's called life. You live in a fallen world. But all things will work together for your good because you love me and are called according to my purpose. Or you can do your thing. Matter of fact, in your terminology, do you. And let's just see how far that gets you. God's like, yo, I bet money. A week from now, you're going to be crying out to me. God, if you could just kick me out of this, please. I didn't know this was going to happen. I did. That's why I told you not to mess with it. But yet, we struggle with this thing. It's just this tension where it's like, my will and God's will. Matter of fact, Jesus wrestled with it, the perfect man ever to live. In Matthew, he says, not my will, but let yours be done. Because part of our human fallen nature is this. It's always this tension between doing what we want and doing what God wants. But here's what you got to understand. The more you run away from what God wants, the more you run away from your fulfillment, the more you run away from your purpose, the more you run away from your destiny. Running away from God is you running away from your purpose. Jonah is a perfect example of this. The prophet Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1, God called him to go preach to the people of Nineveh. That was his purpose. That was his call. The more he ran from that purpose, the worse things got. Some of us are trying to figure out why is so much hell breaking loose in my life. Here's the reason why. Because you're running so much from your calling and your purpose. You're running from God. 
You know exactly what God is calling you to. You may not specifically know, you may not necessarily be able to put your finger on every minute detail of your life, but you have a general conviction about what it is you're supposed to do. But you just think every day of a way to justify you not doing it. I will take the silence as it is hitting home. <laughs> but nonetheless, to bring it back to the good portion, all of us have a plan on our life. All of us have a calling on our life. Look at the person beside you, you have a calling. You have a calling. Because we have a call on our life, God gives us abilities to be able to execute that calling. This is where we get the term spiritual gifts, which brings us here to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on like three principles for tonight. And then over the next few weeks, I'm going to really kind of try to get as specific as I can with the time that we really kind of have. But tonight, I'm going to focus on three things, three things about spiritual gifts. Number one, what they are. Number two, what is their purpose? And number three, what they consist of. I'll say it again. What they are, uh, what their purpose is, and what they consist of. Spiritual gifts. You may be trying to re like figure out, you've heard the term. If you maybe grew up in a church, you may have heard people t talk about spiritual gifts, but they probably didn't really teach on spiritual gifts. I don't know why most churches really don't talk about this nowadays, because these are the very things that the people need, that you and I need to be able to actually function in the church. Because if not, what you now have is you got people in places that are not gifted to be in those certain places. So somebody like me who can't sing, I'm just singing because it looks good to do. <laughs> Talking about make a joyful noise. <laughs> You hear me saying, oh, mm -mm. no, sit down. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have somebody, you know what I mean, trying to do the thing that God uh, did not call them to do and function in it and cause more harm, more harm and more damage than good. It's like having a mean person welcoming people at the greeting, at the door. You know, you know yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm called to greet and be on house team. You know what I'm saying? But you just, but I just don't, I hate people. <laughs> like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And here's what happens, because, because uh, pastors and leaders uh, do not effectively teach people as it relates to what they're gifted to do, now what happens is we have people doing a whole bunch of stuff they should not be doing in the first place. So now what happens is when people come into the church, people have a bad encounter with the church because the people in the church were out of place. So tonight, what we're here to do is to help put some things back in order and help educate us. So, spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? You know what they are? Okay, you don't. Know, I'm going to ask for you. Spiritual gifts. <laughs> Number one, if you're writing this down, this is, this is like, I'm going to just let you guys know over the next few weeks, man. If you never take notes, uh, you probably want to take notes over these next few weeks. Of course, you can go back online and check out these videos. But if, you want, if you're taking notes, man, be, be sure, uh, stay in tune with it. What are spiritual gifts? I'm going to go as slow as I can. There are two Greek words for gifts. Number one, pneuma tikos. Let me spell it for you, because some of y'all like, what? P, some of y'all like, what? You spell new with a P? It's Greek. P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-K-O-S. Pneuma tikos. I'll say it again. P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-K-O-S. This is what this means in the Greek. It means spiritual things. That's one of the translations of the word gift. Second Greek word that's more like that's uh, most of the time used when it comes to spiritual gifts is a word that we have called charisma. C H A R I S M A means grace gifts. Where do we get that from? Romans chapter twelve verse six says this: We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. What, do, what, what does Paul mean there? He says. The grace that God has given us, for those who don't know what the difference between or what grace is, there's two things, grace and mercy. Grace is God giving us something that we did not deserve or things that we did not earn. Mercy is God withholding from us the rightful punishment that we do deserve for our sins, which is death. So because of his grace, he gives us abilities that we did not earn, that we did not learn. I'll say it again. He gives us abilities that we did not earn or learn. There's only one difference between those two words. One has an L, one does not. Some of y'all are like, oh, okay. Um, we have gifts because of God's grace and because of God's choosing, not because of our doing. What do I mean by that? So it's not like one of the things where you can just go to God, God, I really want to be a preacher. Make me a preacher. God's like, no. No, it doesn't work like that. It's called a gift. You don't dictate what gift you get. I think what's like tainted our perception of gifts is because we have wish lists. 
We had Christmas lists when we were growing up. Write down on your Christmas list what gifts, well, on your list what gift you want. So I want a flat screen TV. I want a PS3, I want an Xbox. And then you actually get it. That probably messed us up for real, for real. Because we kind of have the same mentality when it comes to God. We, we think that if I just ask God for whatever I want, he'll give it to me. Let me help you understand. God is not a genie in a bottle. This is not no Aladdin type stuff. No. God is not somebody that you can dictate or control. No. He gives gifts, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, as he so pleases. Remember, you didn't do anything to earn them, and you did not do anything uh, where you could learn them. Uh, Moody, uh, the Moody Handbook of Theology says this. Gifts are, if you're looking for a plain defini definition for spiritual gifts, gifts are this, a divine endowment of special abilities for service upon a member of the body of Christ. I'll say it again. A divine endowment of a special ability for service upon a member of the body of Christ. Before I get into the whole member of the body of Christ thing, there's a difference between gifts and talents. Talents are abilities that you were probably born with or that you can learn how to use from man. Spiritual gifts are abilities you receive when you're born again or given by God and learn how to use from God. In plain, talents are things that you can learn how to do on your own. Gifts are something that God gives you that you did not earn. I say it again. Talents are something that things that you were probably born with, things that you can learn how to do. I can learn how to play basketball. I can learn how to play the keys. I can learn, maybe not learn how to sing because I still have that voice, uh, but I can learn notes and all that type of stuff. I can learn how to skateboard. I can learn how to play with my phone. I can learn all these things, those are talents. I can learn how to create websites and learn how to make music. I can learn that stuff. Different from gifts. Gifts aren't things that you were born with. The world has like, really murked and really really messed up the definition of what gifts are because when we see people who are extremely gifted quote unquote talents or whatever when we see people who sing very well the first thing we say oh man they gifted but this joke ain't no bit saved the next person gifts spiritual gifts that you receive are based upon whether or not you have a relationship with Christ remember what he said here in 1 Corinthians 12 that the spirit gives the gifts now if you don't have the spirit then how can you be gifted Remind it back because some of y'all looking at me crazy. When I receive the Spirit, this how do I receive the Spirit? I receive the Spirit when I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says in Ephesians that now that I accept Christ, I'm sealed with the Spirit. This is how you're saved for once and all for those people who were like, I gotta keep getting saved over and over. No, you don't have to get, keep getting saved over and over again. Once you make the decision honestly, wholeheartedly, confess your sins, believe that Christ died for your sins, rose from the grave in three days, and, and went back to heaven so that way you can have life and have it to the fullest. The minute you make the decision to receive Christ, you are sealed cannot be undone. Bible says this, Jesus says, those who my father places in my hands, nobody can pluck them out. He's talking about you. He's talking about true, authentic believers. I hope this is making sense. So how does he seal us? He seals us by his spirit, who he has placed in us as a guarantee, as a seal, the Bible says, for him when he comes back to get us. So because we have the seal in us called the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. For those who may say the Holy Spirit, it just warms me. It keeps me. It comforts me. No, it's not it, man. Once again, the world has really jacked our perception, our understanding of what the Spirit is. Holy Spirit is a person. Father, Son, Spirit. Triune God all throughout the course of the Bible for those of us who may not have an understanding about that. We'll talk more about that as the weeks go on. But as I receive the Spirit, He gives me these abilities to be able to function according to the calling that God has placed on my life. I hope this makes sense. If this makes sense, just raise your hand. Cool. For those of you guys who don't make it doesn't make sense to, I'm coming to get you very soon. Uh, talents, as I said, abilities that you can learn. Gifts, something that God gives you. Anyone can have a talent, but only believers slash Christians have spiritual gifts. They are given to me by God. As I said, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. Spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit when I receive Christ, when I, have, when I uh, come into a relationship with Christ. That's, that's salvation. Accepting Christ, as I said, means I now have the Spirit living on the inside of me. Romans 8, 10 to 11 says, And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is now living in you. He's talking to the believers in the Roman church. He's talking to those who have a relationship with Christ. You have a relationship with Christ, which simply means that you also now have the Spirit residing in you. That's the only way you and I can live the life that God has called us to live. That's where we get the whole Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. 
Because it's through the spirit now that I'm able to live the life that God has ordained me to live. Outside of the spirit, I can't live the life that God wants me to live. You can't be loving on your own without God. You can't be peaceful without God. You can't be patient without God. You can't be kind without God. You can try. All you can do at best is modify behavior, but eventually the true self is going to show. But nonetheless, when I have the spirit, he now empowers me to be able to walk the Christian life. And he also equips me to be able to function in the Christian life. Now, understanding this. Because the spirit now lives in me, he's gifted me. He's given me these special abilities. It's almost kind of like, you know, uh, a spiritual version of the Avengers. For those of you guys who've seen it. I love that movie, by the way. It's a great movie. You have Iron Man, you have Hulk, you have Thor. Yo, Thor go hard in the paint, man. That hammer. Yo, <laughs> dude, it's for real. You got Iron Man, you got Hulk, you got Thor, you got Captain America, who everybody just writes off, but that dude has a beast gift of leadership. Um, who else you got? You got um, um, uh, Black Widow, and I think that's it, right? Night, oh, uh, uh, Hawkeye, and then I think that's it. I think is that it? Nick Fury don't count because he, I mean, he just pulls the handgun out and just shoots people. That's not really a gift um, at all. Um, special ability. I mean, you can do that. You know, that just makes you special. Um, but nonetheless, the Avengers are great, and here's the reason why: because they all function for the same purpose at the end of the movie, but they all come from totally different backgrounds. Thor is not even from Earth. This dude is from like a whole other galaxy. You know what I'm saying? Iron Man like came upon himself by some freak accident. When he's given some display in somewhere in Afghanistan and the jank just goes crazy and stuff starts blowing up and now uh, metal is beginning to penetrate into his heart. Now he has this device put in his heart to keep him from dying. He ain't playing that out. Got special ability. And on top of that, I mean, he's kind of like a billionaire, what did he say, playboy? Something like that. Um, <laughs> philanthropist, great. Yes. Um, so he becomes a superhero. You got Captain America, who's been endowed with this special physique and physical ability from a bottle is what Iron Man called him. So everything special from you came out of a bottle. I was like, yo, that's fighting words right there, dude. Like, you mess around getting knocked out over that type of stuff. You got Hulk. He's got this inner rage on the inside of him combined with this gamma radiation type stuff. But all of them specialize in different things. Hulk needs Iron Man, just like Iron Man needs Hulk. Matter of fact, Iron Man was falling out of the sky, he's pretty much dead. Power gone from his suit, Hulk comes out of nowhere on some old Hulk smash, comes destroying the building, coming at the dude is off the chain, man. Like, I don't know about y'all. That dude is off the hook. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, let me pause right here since I'm talking about adventures, man. Y'all remember the part in the Movie Man where dude was like, uh, where like they were suiting up and, and, uh, and, and Captain America was like, yo, um, yo, um, you gonna put your suit on? He said, that's the secret, man. I'm always angry. Yes, yes. And it just exploded. Woo! I said, yo, this dude right here. That's the best part. The best part, man. Cats went crazy in the theater at 3 o'clock in the morning. I was there. They have these special abilities, and what makes them special is because they have these abilities that the average person does not have. Let me help you. When you become saved, when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you now have the spirit on the inside of you. You have abilities that the average carnal person does not have. So in essence, you're kind of like a superhero. The problem is you're not the hero. Christ is. That's the difference between us and the Avengers. Yeah, they're limited in their power. Christ is unlimited in his power. I don't know, know about none, of them, none of them that came back from the dead. I don't know none of them that fed two fish, uh, with two fish and five loaves fed 5,000 people. I don't know. I mean, they did some stuff. They flew around and Thor got this magical hammer. You know what I'm saying? That he pretty much idolizes. But Jesus, man, he's like, yo, I don't even, I don't need no weapons, man. I am no weapon. <laughs> yes. I don't, I don't, I don't need, I don't need, I don't need to turn green to show my strength, man. I just tell the sun to stop. I tell the waves, y'all, chill out, man. Y'all doing too much. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, they actually do it. Right. Jesus was the only one who had all these gifts. All these gifts that we're talking about here in 1 Corinthians, he embodied all of them. Hence the reason why he was able to send people out with these different gifts. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as you have the Spirit dwelling on the inside of you. Now, if you're a person, you don't know Christ, you don't have this ability. But the good news is you can tap into this ability once you make the decision to receive Christ. So for some of us in here, because you have a relationship with Christ and you've been gifted, there are certain things that come easy to you. To the average person, it's work. 
Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Certain things make sense to you. Certain things click. With other people, they're scratching their brains trying to figure it out. Certain people, they don't understand how things are going to take place. They don't understand how things are going to happen. They don't even understand uh, why good things are happening to you. Matter of fact, let me prove it to you. Some of y'all, y'all got like the worst GPAs known to man, but you get more opportunities than people that got the best GPA known to man. I'll prove it to you. I know plenty of people, man, who graduated from college, engineering degree, went to engineering school. I mean, them go to engineering school, man, cat's still looking for a job. Years later, had a banging GPA. 4.0. My joint? Don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> I mean, it's maybe half. It's engineering, man. That joint's a beast, man. <laughs> what do you got my money, man? Shoot. <laughs> but I look at it and I'm like, man, God, like, I think about where you have me now and I didn't earn it. I didn't earn it at all. If anything, they should have earned it. But they struggling and for some reason I'm not. And it's not for me to boast in self, it's to boast in who God is. Because without him, I would be just like them. <laughs> I hope this is making sense. Because you have a relationship with Christ, you have been gifted with certain abilities that the average person does not have. So now, while we're talking about spiritual gifts, here's the second thing I wanna talk about. What is their purpose? What's the purpose of spiritual gifts? God has given every person in Christ gifts for them to use to serve the body. Verse 5 in 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working. Notice the two words. Service, working. Service, working. In other words, you are not to just sit on your gifts, but you are actually to use your gifts. You are not to just be like, yeah, man, you know, I got this vicious calling on my life to do such and such, man. And I love it. And you're not doing nothing with it. Some people will be like, man, God, I'll take that gift away. Now, there, I don't see anything in scripture where that's ever happened. Mm. <laughs> Some of y'all just get messed up. Will God take your spiritual gift away? I don't think so. Not based upon what you do. Because he didn't give it to you based upon what you did. So why would he take it away? It's like salvation. It doesn't really make sense. That's a whole other message. Gifts are to be used for service. Not for you to sit on. There's a whole bunch of people in here right now where you're sitting on your gifts. Like there's a whole bunch of people that were supposed to be reached because of you, but because of shyness, because of laziness, because of procrastination, we've allowed the enemy to just come in and run shop through our life to cause us not to function in our gift and people are suffering because of it. But God says it's time for you to stop sitting on your gift and it's time for you to start using it. Look at the person beside you say you gotta do something. He's gives us, he gives us this gift to serve. Gifts are not to be used for personal or selfish gain. Not, it's not like one of the things like my, when I found out my gift, like I have a gift to teach and now I just want to go be a motivational speaker so I can get bank, write books, get paid, drive Lambos, <laughs> get boats, buy an island. How many times do you see that happen to people in the natural? Where they begin to succeed with their talents, not gifts, talents, best rappers, best actors, but years later, best athletes, but years later they broke. Because they used it for self. Matter of fact, I, I hate to say this, man, I was reading, I was reading something the other day about this guy, uh, some of you guys may know him, this quarterback by the name of Vince Young. He played a good portion of his career with the Tennessee Titans. He came into the league seven years ago. Dude is flat broke. He had $26 million guaranteed to him as soon as he signed a contract. This ain't including the stuff he would make as he plays. Guaranteed $26 million. I don't know about you, that's a lot of money. Guaranteed, man? Like, that's like someone saying, hey, we just give you $26 million just for signing with us. You ain't even played yet. This means no matter if you play well or not, you still get this money. But it's flat broke seven years later. Because when you and I have eyes on self, and aren't using it for the greater good, or don't understand why we have it, then we just abuse it. Philippians 1.15, Paul says this in his letter to the church of Philippi. He says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely. You can be gifted and use it for the wrong reasons. And let me help you understand something. Use your gift for the wrong reasons and see what happens. Will God take it from you? Not necessarily. But will he punish you and discipline you for it? Yes, he will. 
One thing that God does not like, all throughout the course of the Bible you see, when people either one, act as if there's something that they're not, false prophets, false preachers, witnesses, whatever, or they have a gift, but decide that they're not going to use it for God's purpose, or they decide they're going to use it for their own purpose. As I said earlier, you heard me mention a guy by the name of Jonah, asked Jonah about this. Jonah ran away from what his calling was. He didn't want to function with his gift. He said, God, I'm not preaching. God's like, how are you going to say that? This is not your gift. I gifted you to preach. I called you to preach. How are you just going to tell me, God, that you, you ain't going to preach? Boy, you know I will snuff you. Mm -mm. But you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just let you suffer. So I'm just going to make life just crazy for you. I'm going to discipline you until you humble yourself, seek my face, and say, not my will, but let yours be done. Yeah, he'll punish you. As a matter of fact, uh, if you go to Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25, I'm not going to read it because it's a kind of a long passage of scripture. But it was this guy by the name of Simon, not Simon Peter, but it was this random guy by the name of Simon. Background information on him in, 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 in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 25. The Bible says that Simon was a sorcerer. In other words, Simon was a magician. He was a dude who was all part of that black art stuff. Some of you guys may know people like that. They're just gothic. It's part of that. They like rolling dice. Hey, I got that. <laughs> I believe in the eight ball. I made my own luck. Harvey Dent style. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know people who are like this. You know people who believe in the black magic stuff, man. They got voodoo dolls and stuff like that, man. You've seen stuff like that, man. For those of you guys who are from Louisiana, man, you've seen it plenty of times. Yeah. He was part of that black magic, that black art type stuff. He was all a part, he was all a part of that crowd. And the Bible says early on in that passage of scripture that he did many signs and the people were marveled and amazed. Wow, this dude walked on water. Wow, he's on that Chris Angel stuff. Man, he made a girl disappear. <laughs> he saw them in half and they're still alive. Like he was on that type of stuff, right? And then all of a sudden he catches wind about the, how the apostles who've been endowed with the Holy Spirit, who've been endowed with the spiritual gifts are now laying hands on people and people are getting healed and also receiving the Holy Spirit. All of a sudden, Simon's like, yo, I want to be a believer, man, because I haven't been doing the right thing. Now, from the outlook, you'd be like, man, Simon done really cleaned up. Dude done made the decision. Then one day comes when Peter and some of the other apostle homies going through the land, laying hands on people, using the gift of miracles that they kind of have that the Lord has endowed them with. Simon says to Simon Peter, that is, Simon, Simon the sorcerer says to Peter, he says, listen, dude, um, yo, give me this gift, man. How much I got to pay for this gift? Because I want to be able to do what you just did. You just laid your hands on them, they, they fell out. You laid your hands on them, and they just went crazy. You laid your hands on them, and all of a sudden, they received the Holy Spirit. I want to be able to do that. How much I got to pay for this? That's what he says. How much How much you selling it for, Simon? How much you selling it for, Peter? What's your cost for this gift of healing, this, this miraculous gift? You know what Peter says to him? He says, listen, dude. Mind you, Peter was like a previously delivered dude from cussing. Like, he'd been saved for a minute, but the Lord was still dealing with him when it came to cussing. Now, I don't think he cussed here. I don't, because he received the spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I don't think he cussed here. But you can see the tension beginning to, like, to flare up, because later on in that passage, he says, Yo, take your money. You and your money can perish. Get out of here. Scram. Beat it, boy. You don't know my past, boy. I'll cut you. Right? You don't hear nothing else from Simon the Sorcerer for the rest of the Bible. <laughs> I ain't say he killed me. I ain't kidding. Some of y'all like, man, did he put a hit out on us? Like, no, he ain't kill my man. He ain't do that. What's the point I'm trying to prove here? The point I'm trying to prove here is, number one, the gift can't be bought. And nor will God honor the gift when it's being used improperly. So there's a certain order in which God has established by how you are to use your gifts. Plenty of people use the gifts God has entrusted to them for the wrong reasons. And God, as I said, will deal with them. We are to use the gifts that God gives us out of our love for God to show people his love for them. That's the whole reason why he gives us the gifts. That's the motivational factor as to why we are gifted. So I'm gifted to preach, man. I'm not getting up here to preach because I want something from you. I'm getting up here to preach because of my love for the Lord. And I want to show you his love for you. It ain't got nothing to do with what I'm going to get out of this, man. I can care less. If I wanted to be in a rich, lucrative business, this is not the place. It's not because it's, it's not about that. Let me help you understand something. You serving in the kingdom, you may not get rich off of it. 
For some of you guys who may come from church backgrounds where you're like, sow this thousand dollar seed and you'll get ten thousand dollars back. Or if you just serve in the kingdom, God will just expand your territory and you'll pay all of your bills. Man, that's the wrong motive. Because the motivation for serving is impure. You think God's really going to honor that? Not at all. The Bible even says God loves a cheerful giver. It's all about your heart. It's all about you using your gifts for the right reasons. So giving or using my gifts is not just to serve the body, but it's also to build up and to edify the church. Verse 7, now to each on the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. God gives you gifts. He gives me gifts to build up the church. As I said, you have a gift. If you have a relationship with Christ, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have a gift that has been designed to build up the church. I'm not just talking about your local church, wherever church is for you back at home. I'm talking about the overall church. This has now to do with your campus ministry. This now has to do with your church back at home. This now has to do with the church at large. God has uniquely gifted you to bless the body. Without the gifts and people functioning in them, in them, the body, the church, would be lacking. When you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, Paul says this. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. However, when we are functioning together, there will be unity and there will be honor. The latter part of verse 26 says this. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. That's the purpose of it. The purpose of it is, is to edify, is, is to build up. And I think once you realize this, you're compelled to want to help people. You're compelled to want to teach people. You're compelled to want to show mercy to people, to extend grace to people. You're compelled to want to do this for people because you have tapped into their purpose. I love the fact that we have so many people in focus who use their gifts, man. But what grieves me even more is we got so many other people who just don't do anything. Like the body will continue to suffer and lack until you step up. Like, there is a need that God has assigned you to meet. Let me help you understand. The thing that bothers you the most that you see, whether, it, whether it's in society, whether it's in your room, whether it's in your family, the thing that bothers you and irks you the most is more than likely the thing that God has gifted you to be able to change. So if your family plucks your nerves, if your family gets on your nerves, you know why? Because God has gifted you in such of a way to be able to fix that which is broken. Not in your own strength. You can't do it on your own. But he's given you the insight and the ability to be able to speak life into that situation. But as long as you just continue to sit back, man, it's just going to be another trifling Thanksgiving like it was last year. <laughs> then it's going to be another trifling Thanksgiving like last year. You eat turkey. You get full. You come back to the semester. Fail classes, I'm just playing. <laughs> Some of you are like, no, that wasn't part of the plan. <laughs> Trifling Thanksgiving, you had me there, but failing classes, no. <laughs> no, until you tap into your gift, you will be so frustrated, so unfulfilled, so empty. And the enemy can also trick you into thinking that because you're busy doing a whole lot of stuff right now, that you're functioning in your gift. That I'm doing a whole lot of stuff. Let me help you understand something. Activity does not equal anointing. No. You could be doing a whole lot of stuff the wrong way. You could be doing a whole lot of stuff that is not what you are supposed to be doing. That is not where God will ultimately want you to be. He wants you to function in your gifts. I'm going to say this in closing. Last thing, what do the gifts consist of? There's three main scriptures that you can go to where the gifts can be found. And we'll talk more about these as the weeks go on. First scripture is Romans chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. It talks about here the different gifts, gifts such as prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, showing mercy. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 11, the scriptures that we just read, and then also verses 27 through 31. Faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation of tongues helps. If you guys are trying to write fast to keep up, it's, it's cool. It's right there in the scripture. <laughs> And then the last scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He talks about the five-fold ministry that you guys may have heard of, maybe if you were in church or you served the ministry at any portion of your life, but you may have heard it mentioned. And even if you haven't, that's cool. That's why you're here. The five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's Ephesians chapter 4, 
verse 11. So those three scriptures, Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. These are the main and core and central scriptures that highlight the spiritual gifts. Every person in here, you have received at least one spiritual gift. Let me also help you understand. Not, no person alone has all gifts. Like, no person is going to be, you can't have the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. It just, <laughs> can't have it, man. You can't have all the gifts because now that would make you Christ. And last time I checked, you needed him to save you. Yeah. So no one person has more gifts or whatever. It's not about who has the most gifts. It's not about who, who doesn't have any gifts. No, it's not about that. Every person in here has at least one spiritual gift. But as I said, everybody does not have all the gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 29, Paul says this. Are all apostles? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? One gift is not better than the other. All are needed. So you can't be like, I'm super spiritual. I'm more spiritual than you are because my gifting is to preach. You just help. <laughs> <laughs> is that kind of something that you're saying? <laughs> I can sing. <laughs> All you do is encourage. <laughs> my gift is better than yours. Now, you have to ask the question, why did Paul have to write this? Why did he have to say, not all are apostles, or all are preachers, or all evangelists, or all do all speak in tongues? Why did he have to say this? Because to the Corinthian church, they were a very immature church, and they had the mentality that if you had certain gifts, that puts you in a spiritual, like, uh, elite status in the kingdom. Like, they thought, like, Yo, if you're a pastor, oh my gosh, we got to worship this dude. My gosh. He's speaking tongues? Yo, I got to get to that place in spirituality. Gosh, you're so deep. Like, man, you're so much spirit. Man, let me help you understand something. I know plenty of cats that speak in tongues that will cuss you out. Right. Y'all laughing. I'm super serious, man. I done heard people say Shondo, Rondo, Chris Bosh, all that good stuff. And <laughs> so they're like, that's a tongue no, nose. I'm just joking. <laughs> I done heard plenty of people say, y'all crazy, man. I done heard plenty of people say that and then do something reckless. I know plenty of preachers, man, who lifestyle aren't really consistent your gifts don't have nothing to do with you remember what I said earlier it's a grace gift which means you didn't deserve it like like if God was to give you something based upon what you deserve it'd be worse than a lump of coal from Santa Claus it'd be nothing at all if that was the case but God gives us grace gifts so if I have this gift to do this I gotta be humbled by it because it's like I didn't deserve this like I'm humbled to be in God's service I'm humbled, one, to be saved by God, and I'm humbled to be serving for God. So I can't look at my gift as better than the other. I am no different than you just because I'm sitting up here preaching the word. That doesn't make me any different. That doesn't make me any better. You are not any better than the person sitting next to you because your gift may be different. No. All of us need to be functioning together. A matter of fact, Paul says it like this, 1 Corinthians 12, 21. He says this, when he's talking about uh, many members in one body, that's what he talks about, like all of our spiritual gifts, they're like body parts in the body of Christ. This is what he says. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. No. And the hand, the head cannot say to the feet, man, I don't need you neither. Verse 24, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Equal concern for each other. So, what is he saying? He says, listen man, you getting all arrogant because you got a spiritual gift is stupid. Here's the reason why. Would you really have, would, does it make sense for the eye to be like, man, here, get out of here, I don't need you. You're stupid. I don't need to hear, I can just see. <laughs> No, no, you need all these body parts. The foot can't tell the arm, man, get out of here. We don't need you no way. No, no, how you gonna pick stuff up? I mean, some of y'all like, I just get creative, use my foot, see, that's pride right there. Exactly, because you think you don't need it. No, man, God gives gifts and he assigns functions for these gifts to work properly. Let me help you understand. Anybody who has ever had a toothache, you know that it messes your whole day up. Mm -hmm. yes. For anybody who has ever had wisdom teeth pulled or whatever the case may be, something that small caused that much pain and puts you on bed rest. <laughs> you need it functioning 
at full capacity. So I don't care, even if you are like well and you're not sick, let that suit start hurting. It's just like being sick. Such is the same way with your spiritual gifts. If, if everybody's not functioning in their gifts properly, then the body suffers, man. The body can't function at its full capacity. This is why you can't look at your gift just as some little accessory part as if it's not worth anything. Like, God has an awesome purpose for your gift. And the longer you sit on it, the more the body will suffer. The more this campus will suffer. The more web gems people will go to, get drunk, have premature pregnancies, be kicked out of school because you are not functioning in your gift. So instead of you judging people and be like, man, they need Jesus. Why don't you go take Jesus to them? Use your spiritual gift instead of condemning them. But as long as we sit on the sideline, they will continue to suffer. The body will continue to suffer because that was another soul that could have been added to the kingdom, which means if it was another soul that could be added to the kingdom, that was another vessel that could be used for the kingdom. Maybe that's the reason why this room is so empty. Because we got so many people right now who are not functioning in their gifts. Plenty, plenty of us who could just come here week in, week out, get the message, but don't go share it with people. Maybe the reason why our roommates don't take us seriously when we invite Bible study is because they see how we act at home. Bible study. <laughs> what? Much as you cuss me out? <laughs> no. Then say, I'm going to pray for you? What? No. <laughs> no. God's calling us to a higher standard. He's calling us to start being obedient to the Spirit, to start working in our gifts. He's gifted you. He's destined you for greatness. Not greatness in your own wealth. I'm not talking about greatness as in you making a whole lot of money. No, God wants to change the world through you. Being in conjunction with his body. So some of us may be saying, all right, now this all sounds good. I'm motivated. I just don't know what my gifts are. That's cool. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. How do I discern what my gifts are? Here's one clue. Start with whatever you're most passionate about. Look at the things that you really can't sleep about. The things that you constantly wrestle with. The things that you can't seem to shake at night. The things maybe that you do very, very well. As I said a few weeks ago, God probably hasn't gifted you to be a nurse or to be a law student if you fail in all your classes. That's, that's, that's not the call. You need to get out before you get out. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe God has not gifted you to be that engineer. Maybe God has not gifted you to be that spe you can't speak you barely can speak English. How are you speaking Spanish? Are you talking about you're a Spanish teacher? You flunking. God's like, man, I didn't call you to teach Spanish, I called you to teach Latin. <laughs> Some are like, oh gosh, no. <laughs> it's a dead language. Why? <laughs> The point is this, man. Look at the areas of your life where you see a lot of fruit. What are the areas in your life where you see some serious increase in fruit? Compare them to the other places that you invest a whole lot in, but don't get you anywhere. Yeah. You can tell whether or not you're called to be in a relationship with that person. Because either they're building you up or tearing you down. And if you haven't grown being with this person, why are you with them? Why are you with them? That don't make sense. Did God really call you to that relationship? Or you just got into it because they were just Christian? Like for real. Like did he call you to that? Because remember once again I said earlier, if you're functioning outside of your calling, outside of your gift, you have put yourself in a hole and it will always be measurable. If we spend more time trusting in the spirit, being spirit led, asking God, what is your will? Do you really want me to be dating right now? Do you really want me to be looking for somebody right now? Do you want me to be looking for anybody at all? Because your Bible does say, seek first the kingdom and everything else will be added. So maybe I should, just shouldn't be looking for nobody. Maybe I should just be looking for you and then maybe somebody will come. That's okay. God understands. It's time for you to start working in your gift. It's time for you to have a serious sit down with God and ask him, God, how have you gifted me? 
Matter of fact, I would encourage some of you guys when you get home, all of us when you get home, start to Google some stuff on spiritual gifts. Now, I would say this: be careful, because there's a lot of crap out here. <laughs> And I mean it, crap. There's a lot of crap out here that's not biblical. Some of us have grown up in environments where we got fed crap and believed it as if it was good gourmet food. It was just really crap. Yeah, people told us that, you know, the, the, the epitome of the call to your ministry, you thought that the calling to preach was just the best calling. No, let me help you understand something, man. For those of you guys in here who say you're called to preach, man, let me help you understand. Welcome to the suffering ministry. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Stuff will get crazy in your life. Stuff will happen to you. You'll go through some, through some real crappy situations. People will look at you crazy. You may not have a whole lot of friends. Yeah. For those of you guys who say you're called to preach and called a pastor, some of us who may be called to serve somewhere. Let me help you understand as well. It won't be easy. Like, it's not supposed to be a cakewalk. No, you're going to face opposition. Anytime the apostles and the disciples were doing God's work, they always dealt with opposition. You will face opposition. Don't, don't, don't be alarmed by it, though. It, it confirms the fact that you've been called. Yeah. If everything just goes perfect, then I gotta raise the question, you know, are you really, really called? You know, I have, I have a, I have an issue with the modern day preacher today. Because the modern day preacher just tells us what we wanna hear. Mm-hmm. You know what that sounds like to me? It sounds like what, what Paul told Timothy. Stand your ground because there will come a time where people will gather around them, people, to preach what their itching ears wanna hear. Mm-hmm. You want to know what people want to hear? In 10 days, you're going to be a millionaire. Mm-hmm. You're going to be debt free. You know what's so crazy, man? Some of y'all, y'all may be too young to remember this, but when I was coming up, 2003, you're going to be debt free in 2003. Man, it's 2012 and cash still in debt. <laughs> <laughs> so either I did something wrong or you a false prophet. <laughs> or maybe both. <laughs> You got all these people making all these declarations and all these promises, man, that, that really don't have anything to do with Christ. I have an issue, like, with, maybe because I'm called to do it, I just, it, I can't stomach it, man. Like, I, I, if, if I didn't care nothing about my iPad, I'd probably throw it at a TV when I watch it. But then Apple's insurance policy is like garbage, so I, I, it wouldn't do me any good. <laughs> Be like Moses throwing down the tablets is broke. Now what are we gonna do? You know, <laughs> the tablet threw down the tablets. Y'all ain't getting it, huh? Um, it's okay. I used to be like that too. <laughs> but but I, I, I take issue. I, I take issue probably because it's my gift, like the gift that not my gift, but the gift that God has given me. Because this is what God has put in me. And for some of you guys, you will feel the same thing when you've been gifted with a certain quality. And you know what it's supposed to be. And you know how it's supposed to function. And you see people functioning in, with the same gift of you, that you have, that God has gifted you with. But you see them doing it the wrong way. It frustrates you. It makes you upset because you understand that's not how it's supposed to be done. It should. That is what separates you from the average person. You want to know why churches are blowing up left and right, man? Because people are just telling people what they really want to hear, man. Last time I checked, man, Jesus had a crowd of people around him in John chapter 6, like verse 66. It was a multitude of disciples that came, and then he started preaching this hard message. You, know, you got to turn away from sin. The Bible says that that, that number began to shrink. Began to shrink. It kind of started to, it dwindled down from a few hundred to 12. To 12. Yeah. Because serving in your gift is not always going to be the most popular thing to do. You're not going to get all the accolades. You're not going to get all the awards. But that's not why we do it. Because you can get a trophy for somebody that ain't be busted and break down a year from now. That's nothing. The reason why we serve is because we want to hear God say those two words, well done. That's why we do it. That's why I preach. I don't, I don't, I don't preach to get an applause, to get an, an accolade, man. No, man. So I should say you live with the end in mind. Thinking about what God's going to say to me when I stand before him. Yo, how were you when you preached to those people at TNT? Did you really handle it with care? Yeah. 
Like, did you just sit on your gift? Could you have done more? Did you procrastinate a lot, Edwin? Tell me the truth, because you know I know the truth. I just want to see what you're going to say. Like, I, I don't want to stand before God and, and, and God be like, why did you wait till you were 70, arthritic, couldn't see, missing teeth, to use the gift I gave you at birth when you accepted me? You've had this gift since conversion. You got saved in college. And you were 80 and you just now using your gift. What are you doing? What are you doing? I pray that does, that's not our testimony for us in here. I pray that it doesn't take like us to be 60 where it's like, hey, I'm going to start serving the Lord. Man, you busted and broke down now. You can't go to no 116 concert, jump up and down with nobody. You know what I'm saying? You got a cane and a walker, you know? Like, talking about it don't matter if I'm young, you know? <laughs> talking about zoning out. <laughs> Some of y'all like, what is he talking about? It's okay, all right. Can't do that, man. Why wait till you old, man? Why wait till you 30? You're 21 now, man. You're in the prime of your life. Serve. You're a freshman. What you waiting on? I'm gonna just wait till I become a junior to get right with the Lord. <laughs> Who said you were going to make it that long? I mean, for real, man. Like, who told you that? You, I mean, Lord told you you going to live to 30 or something? Who told you you going to last that long? I ain't trying to scare you. I'm just being real. Jesus said, man, well, tomorrow's not promised. What are, you, what are you worried about tomorrow for? Yeah. Jesus lived for 33 years. And the impact is still being felt 2,000 plus years later. 33 years, man. Like, Jesus, has, Jesus did more in his short lifetime than people did triple his lifetime. Yeah. And if you want to be technical about it, it was really only three years of ministry. This dude turned the world upside down in three years, man. Let me ask you a question. What have you done in three years of your life? Has it been like the monotonous tune of repeating classes? Break up with a person, get with another person. Break up with a person, get up with another person. Date a year and a half, date another year and a half. Mm -hmm. Is that what you have to show for in three years? I honestly am not trying to bang you over the head and make you feel terrible. I'm really just trying to preach the truth to you and get you off the sideline and get you in the game for you to start using the gift that God has put in you the minute you accepted him as Lord and as Savior. For those of us in here who don't have a relationship with Christ, let me help you understand. One, your life will suck without him. <laughs> Two, your life will be unfulfilled without him. You won't have a clue what to do. But if you made the decision today to accept Jesus Christ, you will be in the game. He will gift you with some amazing abilities. Things that will blow your mind. Stuff that you said you would never do, you end up doing. Point blank. The minute you made the decision to receive Christ. So as I said, for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about that. My prayer tonight, though, is that you would go home. You would wrestle with this word, man. After the election goes off, after you find out who's president or whatever, that you would really begin to wrestle with this. That you would really get, be, begin to contemplate this whole calling aspect. Don't waste your life, man. Don't get to senior year and be like, man, I really wish I would have tapped into this a long time ago. Don't wait till you're 30 having regrets. Man, I really wish I would have used my gifts and focus. I really wish I would have taken more advantage of the time I had as a college student when I wasn't working 40 plus hours a week. When all I did was go to class twice a day, spend time with God, find out my gifts. I, you, by the time you get to the work world, man, you had a disadvantage. You working 40 hours. Then you tired when you get home. You don't even want to go nowhere. You sleeping. God's like, yo, don't, don't, don't wait to that. It's an uphill battle. The longer you wait, the worse it gets. Doesn't mean that you can't turn away and you can't do it then, but, but why wait? Why wait? Start now. Like for, use your gift now. If I was to tell you that somebody getting saved was predicated based upon you making the decision tonight, what would you do? Like, how would you respond? You're talking about somebody's eternity, man. We're not talking about no light, right? Play, play stuff, man. We're talking about cats dying and going to hell or heaven. And that's predicated based upon you using your gifts. Imagine if Jesus was sat on his gift. Imagine if Jesus does not tap into his anointing 
We all are condemned to hell. But thank God that he did not sit on his gift. What would have happened if Paul would not have responded in faith to that conversion experience on the road to Damascus and functioned in his gift? We would not have what we have today. We wouldn't have this foundation to build on. Such is the same with you. You can change a generation and a campus today, tonight, right now, if you would make up in your mind that I'm sick and tired of sitting on my gifts. I'm sick and tired of living a mediocre life, man, trying to figure out what I'm gonna do. Some of you guys are thinking right now, but that may, that may mean I have to change my major. So be it. God will make the resources available for you to make it all the way through. That may mean I may have to transfer schools. So be it. Follow the Lord. That may mean I have to break up with this person. That may require more time in my word. So be it. Isn't a little bit more time worth somebody's eternity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't a sacrifice now worth the fullness of joy later? Isn't it worth it now? But I don't want to get up here and sing in front of all these people because people are going to look at me funny and all that. But isn't a few minutes of sacrifice and humiliation, if you want to call it that, worth somebody leaving out of here with a lifted spirit? As opposed to coming in here contemplating suicide and going out with the same thought that they had coming in? Isn't it worth it? Take your eyes off self. Stop saying what you can't do. Stop making excuses as to why you cannot do it. God, the creator of the world, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of you and me and the person next to you has gifted you. He's given you the power. You've received it. You've got to walk in it. It's time for you to walk in it.